Father, we thank you that you have united us to your Son. We thank you that you've united us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope we have of an inheritance in the kingdom of God promised to us through your Son. And we thank you for the new life we have. And we pray that this morning you would teach us how to live out that new life in the middle of a, a world that still rejects him. Please teach us your ways and help us to live lives that bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Well, I hope you've got uh, Ephesians 5 open in front of you there. If you haven't, now's a great chance to just reach over to the end of the pew and, uh, and grab uh, one of the Bibles there and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Someone perhaps tell me what page it's on in the pew Bibles. 978. Everyone can tell me what page it's, it's on. That's great. 978. Fantastic. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, big number 5, and uh, we'll uh, look through uh, uh, those first 21 verses. This week I was listening to a podcast with uh, Melvin Bragg, uh, it's uh, often uh, very interesting, called In Our Time. They were discussing Edward Gibbon, who wrote a uh, famous uh, historical work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, wrote it in the 18th century. And one of the features they noticed was that in the earlier chapters of his work, he tended to present uh, the, the major characters, the emperors and so forth, as heroic figures who sort of stepped in and shaped and changed the course of history. But as he went on in his work, and perhaps as he sort of felt more and more the weight of history and the, and the direction it was flowing in his, in his work, uh, he tended to present his characters more as people who were swept along on the tides of history and whose lives were shaped by the history that they were part of. And it seems, as he went on, he even struggled to write and never finished his autobiography because he saw himself more and more as, uh, as the product of his circumstances rather than the actor who was shaping his own life. And I wonder how much do you feel that you are shaped by the world around you and by, uh, and by circumstances and how much you feel that you shape the world. Now in Ephesians, Paul opens up a new possibility for us, not uh, that we be shaped by the world, nor even that we are the shapers of our own lives, but he opens up the, opportunity, the possibility that Christ be the one who shapes us in the middle of our, our world and that through us Christ shape other lives too. He talks a lot about light in this passage because we live in a world of darkness. Back in chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 we saw a few weeks ago uh, he sets out how uh, the world is in the or the whole, whole human race is in the grip of what he calls uh, that famous uh, trio the world the flesh and the devil, a trio who hold the human race enslaved in rebellion against God, alienated from him and facing his judgment. And that's the darkness of the world that shapes us outside of Christ. But Christ's coming has changed all of that for us. In verse 8, little number 8, if you cast your eyes down there, he says, at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He wants us to teach us how to live as light, shaped by his light, not by the darkness of the world around us or even the darkness within us, our sin dwelling in our hearts, and also how to shine the light of Christ to the world around us. The passage, I think, naturally falls into three sections, verses 1 to 2, speak, speaks of the source of the light, uh, verses 3 to 10, encourage us to live in the light, and then verses 11 to 21 tell us to shine the light. So first of all, verses 1 to 2, the source of the light. Paul gives us, I think, three ways in these couple of verses that we receive God's light in order to change our hearts and lives in the middle of a dark world. Firstly, he says we must know the character of God. Look what he says in verse 1. Therefore, he says, be imitators of God as beloved children. Do you know, a funny thing happens when you become a parent. You discover 
how much like your own parents you are, even if you don't want to know that. You spend your teenage years thinking, don't you, that you're nothing like your parents and uh, possibly even trying your best to be nothing like them, perhaps even promising yourself that you will be nothing like them. You have children, you discover you're just the same and you find those same phrases popping out of your mouths uh, that uh, you always laughed at in your parents. You know, uh, if I come up there and I find it, so help me. And of course, that, that, that sentence never finishes you know if, if I if somebody told you to jump off a cliff would you do it and um, I remember uh, uh, you know, discovering myself saying the words you could have someone's eye out with that and of course the best one is you know it will all end in tears uh, every parent's a prophet of doom from time to time uh, we're hardwired to imitate our parents whether we like it or not, we just can't help it. And in the same way, we will imitate God if he is our father, if we have that relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ, we will imitate him, or at least we will imitate God as we understand him, as we perceive him to be. And that's why understanding the Bible's teaching about God is so essential because we have to have the right understanding of God, the right view of God, the right picture of God in our hearts and minds if we are to imitate the true God. We find in the Bible characters like the Pharisees who seem to imagine that God was only a judge. And so they became terribly judgmental. The pagans in Ephesus where Paul is writing to the Christians, uh, the pagans around there thought uh, that their gods were thoroughly immoral. And so they had the attitude, well, anything goes. But if we believe the truth God has set forth in, verses, uh, uh, in chapters 1 to 3 of this letter, then we will live as God calls us to in chapters 4 to 6 we will start to become more like Jesus. And so it's essential that we know the character of God, that we keep going back to the Bible and let the Bible challenge our presuppositions about what God is like. It's the work of a lifetime. We constantly need to let the Bible shine its light on us to show us God as he truly is so that we're not just projecting our own images onto him. And then secondly, we are to know the love of Christ if we are to have his light in our life. Verse uh, 2 there, the start of that, uh, Paul says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We are to know the love of Christ. Love, uh, love from one person can't help but produce a response of some sort in the other, just as uh, treating someone badly produces a response in the other person. I think of uh, a friend who, uh, who had a new job, he traveled a, a long way, and, uh, and for his first day on the job, and he, he was five minutes late, and, uh, and he knocked on the office door, and, uh, and the boss berated him for being five minutes late, and slammed the door in his face. That's a, a bad start <laughs> to a relationship, and very hard to row back from there. But then on the other hand, perhaps if you think of the people in your life who have been most kind to you, and think of the warmth with which you regard them, how grateful you are for them, and, and the love you have for them, and how you will be willing uh, to do for them as they have done for you. Now, no one has loved us as much as Christ has loved us, who gave himself up for us, dying on the cross in our place, bearing in his own body there on the tree the sins and the judgment that belongs to those sins, the judgment that we deserve, so that we could know God's forgiveness, so we could know God as our Father for all eternity, cleansed from our sins, forgiven forever. You know, how much he has loved us. No one else has done that for us. Now, we don't become more loving 
by just trying harder, but by looking at Christ, receiving his love, accepting more fully the, what he has done for us. That's why Holy Communion is so powerful, isn't it? As we receive the bread and wine, we're receiving once again, trustingly, the forgiveness, the love, the grace that Christ has for us. And we're transformed by it. So we're to know the love of Christ. And then thirdly, we are to know the pleasure of God. Paul finishes up verse 2 there. Speaking of Christ, giving himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. His death was for us, in love for us, but it was also an offering and sacrifice to God. And Paul uses the language of the Old Testament here, a fragrant offering, literally a pleasing aroma to God. That's how the sacrifice of the Old Testament is spoken of. And Jesus' death was to God the perfect act of worship, the perfect sacrifice. Now, we can never do what Jesus did, and we know that nothing that we offer to God in worship can truly be a perfect offering, even a good offering, even our best efforts are tainted by sin, aren't they? Mucked up and spoiled. We perhaps come to church and we come with good intentions. We're thinking, I'm going to uh, praise the Lord and, uh, and offer him thanksgiving. Um, but then we find we're singing a song and we find our minds wandering and we're thinking about the shopping list that we haven't quite got completed yet. But when Jesus died, he not only took our sin away, he also gave us his righteousness. He took our sin on himself. He gave his righteousness to us. So that even though, yes, our offerings are imperfect in so many ways, yet as we serve God, he sees not our imperfections, but the perfections of Christ. And our offerings, offered through Jesus, are cleansed and washed by his blood and made pleasing sacrifices to him. And of course, anything that's actually good in us is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, that God is working through us. And is it a great thing to know the pleasure of God that as we serve God, as we seek to live the life he calls us to, that our lives are pleasing to him? Now, Paul begins here, in verses 1 to 2, by going back to God and seeing him as the source of light because we cannot change our lives ourselves, no matter how hard we try. You may have heard that uh, uh, when uh, John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, who uh, later on became great leaders of the, uh, of the Christian revival in the 18th century, when they went to Oxford University, they started what uh, became known as the Holy Club, other people called that. They used to meet together. Uh, they were very influenced by a book they had read by a chap called William Law. It was a very famous book at the time. It's called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. And, uh, and this book um, recommended a very rigorous discipline in prayer and fasting and good works. And so they took this uh, very seriously. Uh, the book advocated the idea that uh, it says, to change your heart, you must change your life. And they became known as the Holy Club because they took it so seriously. Now, two years after they left Oxford, John and Charles Wesley went on a mission to Georgia in America, and uh, they tried to do various things, start a religious community in an orphanage, all ended in tears, as any parent could have told them, and, uh, and it, it didn't work out terribly well. It was a dreadful failure. But someone there asked John Wesley, do you know Jesus Christ? And John Wesley said, I know he is the savior of the world. But his friend asked him, do you know that he is your savior? And John Wesley uh, didn't know what to say. He was unable to answer. And he wrote in his journal, I went to America to convert the Indians, but who will convert me? And it was only later at a Christian meeting as he heard the gospel 
that uh, he did trust Christ for salvation and uh, told in the famous phrase that uh, he felt his heart strangely warmed as uh, he gained the assurance of forgiveness and salvation. And, uh, and it was from there that he and others uh, did the great works that bore such good fruit that we benefit from even today in this country. So it's not, as William Law said, that we change our lives in order to change our hearts. But we need our hearts changed in order to change our lives. And God is the source of that change. He is the source of the light that we need. He's like the sun, we're just like the moon that reflects the light out. So if we want to live the life that Paul speaks of here in chapters four to six. We want to live the lives that we're called to. We don't just form a holy club and try and uh, have rigorous discipline and fasting and particular hours of prayer and so on. Actually, if we depend on ourselves, we only find in ourselves darkness. That's what we've got to offer ourselves. We'll be uh, crushed in despair. But if we go back to God, we find in him the light that transforms us, that changes our hearts. Uh, we go back and we see the character of God, the love of Christ, the pleasure of God, and we're changed. So we need to uh, go back to the light, and then verses 3 to 10, live in the light. In this passage, there's this constant sense that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And in verse eight, as we've seen, he says the believers have moved from one to the other, from darkness to light. Verse three, he refers to them being saints, God's holy people set apart for him rather than verse six as they were, sons of disobedience. Back in chapter one, he said, they've got an inheritance waiting for them in the kingdom of God. In verse 5, he warns that the idolater has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But even while we wait for that inheritance, we've undergone such a radical change that we cannot live in darkness as we did before. So verse 7, he says, Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that's good and right and true. And try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. We're to live a new life because we've been given this new life in Christ. And as, ho as uh, saints, we're God's holy people set apart for him. And Paul sets out three areas in which we are to live this new and holy life. Look at verse 3. He says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. First area there, sexual morality. The Greek word behind that is uh, one from which we get an English word. The word is porneia. And it was a Greek word that uh, was used particularly by Jews to cover all sexual immorality is defined by the Bible. Uh, it covered any kind of sexual activity outside the marriage of one man and one woman, as uh, Genesis speaks of. Fornication, adultery, and homosexuality all come under this umbrella term. Now, of course, today, just as in the time of the New Testament, Sexual immorality in general has been normalized in our society. Just the other day, I was, um, I was looking at a BBC News, uh, the BBC News website, and uh, I came across an article which looked at some research that showed that about half the adult population in this country now use porn. Half the adult population. Um, and, and it's not just the male half, about half the adult population. Now, that in itself is horrifying, but what really highlighted for me how mainstream it has become is that usually, I mean, the BBC is 
you know, generally quite a flag carrier for so-called progressive morality. But um, the BBC, even, will generally try and present two sides, both sides of an issue. But as they spoke about how uh, mainstream porn had become, they only had words of praise for it. And they didn't even seem to feel that there was another side, that there was a concern uh, that this could be viewed as a bad thing in anybody's eyes. Sexual immorality is now mainstream. And there will be people who try and uh, encourage you in one way or the other, whether it's the BBC uh, or anybody else, who try and encourage you uh, that sexual immorality is okay, it's good. But verse 6, Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Not just the sexual the morality, the impurity and the covetousness as well. Now, of course, this isn't to say by any stretch of the imagination, if somebody has committed some act of sexual immorality or impurity or covetousness, for that matter, that they cannot enter the kingdom of God. But what it does mean is that we cannot live without Jesus as our king and then think somehow we will be in the kingdom of God. You can only be in the kingdom if you have the king, right? And so if, uh, if we find these are things that we've fallen into, we need to repent and turn back and put Jesus at the center of our lives. The second area uh, he mentions then here is purity of speech. And because immorality is so mainstream, it's very easy to fall into all kinds of uh, conversation uh, that follows in that path. Uh, never mind switch on the TV and see things way before the nine o'clock watershed uh, spoken of or, or acted out that are unhelpful. Uh, dirty jokes and rudeness and swearing. Paul's saying they're all displeasing to the Lord. They stop us offering the fragrant offering uh, that should come from our lips. Now, Christians do sometimes wonder, you know, is swearing really a big deal? I mean, they're just words, right? But the problem is, with swearing, that it's cursing God's good creation. It's the opposite of the thanksgiving that he speaks of in verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place for saints, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So swearing is effectively taking some part of God's good world. It's uh, normally um, some part of the human body or something to do with human sexuality, a good thing that God has created, and turning that into a negative thing that's used to speak badly about something. I'm not going to give you examples. You can probably work those out in your own mind. But it's taking God's good gifts of sexuality and the human body and turning them into something with which to curse another part of God's world. Um, just, just think, you know, you're driving along in the car and the car breaks down and uh, you're in a rush to get somewhere and you're feeling the pressure and you whack the steering wheel and you say, stupid car. Okay? Uh, you might find other expressions as well but even if you're saying stupid car what are you doing this is the car that god has given you this is god's good gift to you and you're cursing it instead of offering thanksgiving uh, the purity of your lips is being uh, debased uh, by uh, by cursing and even more so when we're then using parts of the human body and so on to speak negatively about it our lips are holy and they are for God, for giving thanks and to give grace to those who hear. But he also does speak here as well about true worship. In that verse 5 it says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Coveting, which is kind of lusting, after things 
is a kind of idolatry. It's a kind of false worship. It's treating a thing, part of the creation, as if it is the creator. This is the thing that I must serve. I remember, well, a, a friend of mine um, who uh, wanted a, a particular sports car, and she'd wanted this thing for ages. And then she said she realized, I was thinking as if only this sports car and having it could give me peace in my heart. And perhaps you've had that experience. It's treating a thing as if it can give you what actually only God can give you. And of course, you get the sports car and then there'll be something else over the next horizon uh, that you lust for and covet after. And we do that when we base our identity on what we wear. You know, or when we uh, you know, feel confident because of the things we've got and how they make us look before others. When we base our sense of worthiness on the job that we've got. And I feel I've got worth because I have this particular role. Uh, when we get a sense of uh, purpose because of the marks that we've achieved in, in some exam in the, in the past or the present, when we base our security on the money that we have, all trying to base the things that only God can give us on the things of this world. But true worship is to offer our hearts, our lips, our lives to God for his glory alone and trust him to provide what we need. So this passage shows us two kingdoms, two destinies, the wrath of God or a glorious inheritance. And we mustn't be fooled. If we've fallen into impurity or impure speech, into sexual immorality in our minds as a habit, as a practice uh, with the internet or with another person, we're not living in the light. And we need to go back to the source of the light, not forming a holy club, but go back to the Lord Jesus Christ because verses 11 to 21 tell us that having been made light by God the source of the light we are to shine that light to the world around us Paul here turns our attentions from how we are to live our lives kind of within ourselves to how we are to live it as we come into contact with the world around us and including with the church itself Verse 11, he says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. We don't spend our time gossiping about them. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Now, in those days... Uh, they didn't have a clear idea of how light worked. They didn't know about photons and light waves and all those kind of things. But uh, they, they essentially knew that if you lit something up, you know, you uh, had a torch at night or something like that, um, and you got that lit up, then you lit other things up, and they kind of became light as well. They reflected back. Now, Paul is saying that Christ has made us light, like the sun shining on the, on the moon, as if we are now a, a source of reflected light for others. Christ has lit us up, verse 14. He uses uh, what uh, is probably a, a, an early baptism liturgy here, verse 14. Therefore it says, in these words that they all seem to know, perhaps from their baptism, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We come to know Christ, his light shines on us, and then we are to shine in the same way to others. Now, sometimes that will be very difficult. Shining is a light in a dark world. The darkness doesn't always welcome the light. But sometimes Christians can have a greater impact on the world around them. I, I remember a, a friend telling me of a... Um, uh, an occasion where a boss had done something particularly uh, troublesome to everybody and she didn't want to join in the gossip that was going around the lunch table um, 
But she went to her boss and spoke to her and said, you know, this is what's happened and this is how uh, people are feeling about it. And as it happens, difficult as that was to do, to act with integrity and with kindness in that situation, um, actually the boss really appreciated how it had been dealt with and then wanted to know why she was not joining in the backbiting and, uh, and why she was, uh, how could she could be so forgiven. She was able to share her Christian faith. Uh, I think of another time, on the other hand, um, where I was standing at a telephone box in the days when such things existed, and um, I, I was making a call. A man came up on a moped. He leapt off his, off his moped. He had a handful of leaflets in his hand, and uh, he said, all right, mate, mind if I put a few of these up in the phone box? And they were adverts for prostitutes. And, and I said, well, certainly not. Um, and uh, and that his reaction was extraordinary. I mean, he... he uh, I, I expected him just to hang around and wait till I was finished. What he actually did was he threw leaflets in the air and he started shouting and swearing at me. He got on his moped and still shaking his fist at me. He had his helmet in one hand that he was, he was waving around. I thought he was going to crash as he, as he headed off and went off shouting. And I thought, I've pricked a conscience there. I've, I've touched a little nerve, I think. Um, now, it might have been that he'd have, he'd have lamped me one. I could have come off uh, badly from that. But the light coming into contact with darkness sometimes um, has uh, very difficult effects, sometimes wonderful effects. But when we live for Christ, it will make us stand out for sure. And because it's hard, we need to pray for wisdom. As Paul uh, speaks in verses uh, 15 to 17, we need to be wise in how we use our time, in what we say, not get drawn aside into folly, understand the Lord's will. And more than that, we need to look for strength and renewal in the right place. A lot of people uh, go home at the end of the day and they think, what I really need is a glass of wine. That's what's going to renew my strength. But no, Paul says, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. It's just a plunging into serving my own senses it's a whirlpool that drags us down he says no but be filled with the spirit and how do we get filled with the spirit and what happens when we're filled with the spirit verses 19 to 20 four things addressing one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing making melody to the lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. As we seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we gather together, speak God's word to one another, draw close to him in praise and thanksgiving and find our strength and the, our knowledge of his light renewed. Now there's a town in Norway called, and I think it's pronounced, Ryukan. And it's in a valley in the mountains. And it's in such a valley, it's really surrounded by mountains in this little flat space in the middle. And for nearly six months of the year, this town gets no direct sunlight at all. It's in shade, even in the middle of the day. Uh, but there was an engineer called Sam Ede who place three large mirrors on the tops of the mountains around it and they're massive mirrors and they are controlled by computers in order to track the sun as it goes across the sky and to reflect the light of the sun down onto the market square so for the first time in its history now people can go to the market square and they can actually sit in sun sunlight even in the middle of winter. I think it's a great picture of the world around us, a world that's in darkness, a world that perhaps has no access to God. You think of your uh, neighbors, your family, your friends, workplace colleagues. Do they have the light of God shining on them 
directly in their lives. Do they ever hear anything from God's word? Do they know anything of Jesus Christ and the love that he's shown us? But we can reflect something of God's light to them in our lives. Now maybe this morning as we look at this and we see the responsibility and the opportunity that God gives us as Christ to shine God's light into other people's lives, to shape their lives by his love. Well, it may be that we can think of particular people that we could show the love of Christ to. It may be that within our own circumstances at the moment, there are difficulties and we're wondering, should I should I stand up for Christ in this area or should I just leave it? Perhaps it's unimportant. How will we shine the light to those around us? And it may be as we look through the, these verses that we think, actually, I've led a whole load of darkness into my life. And there are things that I need to repent and turn back to the Lord about and seek for his light to come in and transform me. Let's just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that Jesus Christ is not just a reflection of your light, but he is the source of the light. He is God himself. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that our Lord Jesus Christ laid his life down for us. And we thank you that his death for us was a wonderful sacrifice, a fragrant offering offered to you in perfect worship. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to receive afresh this morning the love of Christ. Help us to turn away from all that displeases him, all that fails to honour him, everything that stops his light shining in us and through us to others. And we pray, Lord, that wherever we find ourselves this morning, whatever difficulties we have, um, whatever darkness there might be around us, help us to stay true to Jesus, to live as saints, speaking and acting in a way that's honouring to him and shining his light to others. We pray for the renewing power and help of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.